All right. Welcome, everybody, to another of the Madcap Software webinars. This time around, we have a guest presenter. His name is Chad Krieger. He's the senior technical writer at Vernier Software and Technology. And he's speaking on a subject that is kind of near and dear to a lot of our customers' hearts, importing content from Microsoft Word. And that's one of those things that at the surface, it sounds really easy, but as the saying goes, you know, the devil's in the details. There are a lot of options that be, can, can be configured when doing a Microsoft Word import. And Chad's going to kind of spotlight some of those options for us and give us some best practices. However, before we jump in and get started, we have a little bit of housekeeping to go over. Uh, if you're new to this webinar interface, all of your microphones are on mute. So if you do have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to ask those but ask in the question and answer panel that is a part of this webinar software. And then the other thing I want to make sure that everybody realizes, so you don't have to all ask individually, yes, this is being recorded. At the end of the presentation, we will be wrapping up that recording, wrapping up any of the questions that were submitted, and you will all be getting an email with a link to all of those resources. All right, so with that housekeeping taken care of, I'll turn it back over to Chad. Take us away into the glorious world of importing Word content. Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, one housekeeping item before I get started, do I click the Start Broadcast button now, Mike? I just wanna make sure I'm on the same page as you. Nope, you are broadcasting now, it is all good. Okay, I had a little window up here, so. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. One of the great things about our Flare community is everyone's willingness to share knowledge and tips with one another. And it's truly my privilege to get to share with everyone some tips I've learned in my experience of importing quite literally hundreds of files from Word to Flare. Before we get started here, a little bit more information about myself. I've been using Flare now for nearly nine years. I think it'll be nine years next month. And I can definitely say that the import process looks quite a bit different than when I first started. I work as a senior technical writer at Vernier Software and Technology in Portland, Oregon. And many of you may be familiar with the Vernier story. We uh, shared our implementation story at Madworld a couple of years ago, and I've also uh, pr provided that story as a webinar as well, where we have migrated uh, so much content from Word to Flare, and we'll be looking at the Word import tool that was so useful in that journey today. I'm also the founder and organizer of the Portland Flare user group, I teach a FLARE course at Portland State University uh, where I teach topic-based authoring. And I'll be at Madworld again this fall, speaking on this topic again, but with a deeper dive looking at some of the advanced techniques that you can do to prepare your Word documentation prior to the, the Word import process. We'll look at find and replace techniques and macros and, and a few other tips that we simply won't have time to, dis, uh, to discuss today. And I'll also uh, be taking folks through a spin through Madcap Central as well. So I hope to see you all then. The company I work for, Vernier, is celebrating its 40th year as a leader in science education this year. And I've been there now for nearly seven years. So right at the start of our Flare implementation journey. And since adopting Flare, we've grown our Flare project to consist of dozens of science lab books, hundreds of user manuals, and a number of miscellaneous projects, including the company employee handbook, which we uh, brought that into Flare just this very la the, the, just this last year. Before Flare, though, we had a well-maintained library of decade upon decades of Word content. These are well-organized fo files. We follow a style sheet, uh, a style guide on our team for formatting, 
and word choice. And ultimately, it became the task of a lifetime and has proven to be very much a full time job importing these files into Flare and managing quite literally tens of thousands of pages of content of a team of just four people. These great achievements would seem unfathomable if not for the word to flare import wizard. That may seem like an exaggeration or a sales pitch to keep listening, but I could hardly imagine what our migration process would have looked like if we had only leveraged manual tasks. I have a screenshot below of the front page of one of our, our user manuals, the stainless steel temperature probe, and if I didn't have this flare import process to follow, I would, I would be left with a series of manual tasks that would involve going to the content explorer in flare, creating a placeholder folder, creating individual topics for each of the, the sections that I wanted to represent, probably having word up side by side with flare, copying and pasting my content from word into flare, unfortunately losing all of my formatting along the way and having to reapply my styles manually based on my style sheet settings in Flare. And if that wasn't enough work, I'd have to manually drag and drop my, my, my new files from the Content Explorer over into a newly created table of contents, probably with words side by side, making sure that my content appears in the proper order and that I haven't skipped over any any topics. Imagine doing that for hundreds of files and then let alone throw, throw in our, our lab book files and our employee handbook and I can say that that process would just feel like a nightmare if I had to do all of that manually. So thank goodness the word import wizard streamlines all of those tasks and that's what we'll be learning about today. And there's even some newer features to review. So if you've imported some content to Flare before, but maybe it's been a couple of years, you may not be familiar with the new drag and drop features and the, the revised interface. So first we'll look at how to clean up our Word documents. We'll learn how to think about our documents as a collection of topics and how to use styles appropriately. Then we'll look at each of the wizard settings and how they affect your import process. So whether you're new to Flare and you have mostly factory settings, very little content, and, and maybe even a limited style sheet, or if you're experienced with Flare with hundreds of files, maybe even some experience in content migration, I'll be speaking to both sets of users today. And finally, we'll look at some recommended tasks to perform after the import process, just to make sure all of your added files integrate seamlessly within your project. As the story, as the saying goes, failing to plan is planning to fail. And that may sound a little dramatic, but just like so many other things, the more you plan ahead, the more you'll be able to leverage all of the advantages of a clean import to Flare. So the first thing you wanna think about is the documentation that you plan to move into Flare. How many files do you have? How long are these documents? How similar is this content? Are there, are there differences in your documentation type? So at Vernier, in short, we had hundreds of files to import for both lab books and user manuals, and ultimately down the road, our employee handbook too. All of these files varied in size. Some of our lab books are hundreds of pages long, and some of our user manuals are just a mere dozen pages or less. Ultimately, our implementation story wasn't this triumphant 10,000 page import that we did in one fell swoop with all sorts of legwork up front, but it's a story of hundreds of smaller imports. As, said in a previous, as I said in a previous presentation, Rome wasn't built in a day and neither was our Flare project. So, some of our imports are even as small as just a page or two, and I can talk about a couple of those today as well. I think my largest import was probably about 100 pages in length. We also knew that our content would undergo periodic revisions as software titles and new products get released, and that new documentation would be added regularly to Flare as new content is developed. 
One thing that's important to note about our Flare, Im our Flare implementation project and moving our content from Word to Flare was it's, it's not like our, our organizational structure gave the publications team any sort of a break and said, all right, let's not give them any more content for about six months. They're implementing a new system. Uh, let's let them get all of the old content migrated into Flare, and then we'll start giving them new content. That's not really how businesses work. So we were kind of caught in between of implementing and migrating a lot of old Word content while generating new Word con new content to bring into Flare simultaneously. So we had to prioritize our content. What are our highest selling products? What are our, our highest volume documentation that gets read? and is important to our customers while still producing new content at the same time. We also tried to identify content similarities to streamline some of our workflows. Finding content similarities really helped us shift from importing content to using templates even for some of our user manuals. You'll find that the more content you have in Flare, the more opportunities for single sourcing or reusing your content in multiple places uh, be becomes an opportunity. That means that future imports might even be smaller if you can leverage content that is already in Flare. To exemplify this, the first half dozen or dozen user manuals that I brought into Flare, I noticed something right away that I was actually importing a lot of the same content over and over and over again even though the temperature sensor and the pH sensor at a surface level have very different uses and are completely different products, there was a lot of content overlap that was very similar, especially when variables and snippets were introduced to our topics. Things such as the repair information, uh, what's included lists, uh, the warranty, a lot of the legal jargon that you see in the super fine print at the end of the user manual, a lot of that content was very much the same. And once I was able to identify that in my future imports, I was able to look at another product and say, well, I already have, you know, six of these 20 topics in Flare. I'll just go ahead and strip those out of my import and, and share that topic in multiple places later on. So you really wanna start thinking about your content up front. It seems like a lot of work up front and it really is, but no matter how much upfront effort you put into this, try not to get caught up in analysis paralysis. Eventually it's best to just pick a small subset of content, set a reasonable goal, import that content into Flare and grow your project little by little. Also, Try to adopt a mindset that detaches yourself from thinking about your content in the context of a document and more so as a collection of topics. One of the questions that I get asked frequently is, well, what's the right size for a topic? And there's a few things that are, that are kind of fatally wrong with that question. It's kind of like asking somebody, how big should a house be? And every house is going to have different needs and every topic is going to have different needs. Some people want a three bedroom, two bath house with a yard. Some people are, are content having a condo. It really depends on the location of where you live and, and whatnot. And that's kind of a good way to think about your topics. Try not to get caught up in how long should my topic be but try to get into a mindset of how do I want to use my topics most effectively in Flare. A couple of pointers though, a good topic is limited to answering one complete piece of information. This shift is particularly useful for content that will be imported and transformed into web copy. Your content becomes a lot more navigable and searchable as it becomes a smaller chunk of information. Also, Try to think about content reuse. How many other places can you use any given topic in Flare? So in the example topic below where I have some repair information copy from the uh, temperature sensor we've been looking at, we see that this answers a fairly complete question and only one question. It gives you some information about who to contact if you're 
if your sensor has some problems, how to get it shipped in for a repair, you have some contact information. But that's as far as this topic goes. It doesn't tell you how to turn the sensor on. It doesn't give you any of the other warranty information. It doesn't describe all of the other experiments and all the great things you can do with this product. It's very limited to repair information only, and that's it. Number one, it makes this copy much more easily to, to sort through on the web. And number two, this topic becomes very useful for content reuse in my project. Because it's limited to just this very specific information that is that that pertains to so many other products, I can use a variable for the product name and simply reuse this topic in all of my other user manuals. And then if the email address or a phone number or some of this information changes, I can update that content in one place and manage that in the whole project that way. So it's a really good idea to, to think about how you want to use your topics in Flare. And it can be a little tricky when they all live in these, in these really long Word documents right now to detach yourself from the document, but try to start thinking about your content as topics and not so much uh, really lengthy Word documents. To achieve the cleanest import, your Word documents really should be using styles and not inline formatting. So if you're new to, to Flare or you're new to using styles, you can actually use styles in Word and Flare, and these map over very nicely when used appropriately. Inline formatting is when you're writing along in your document and all of a sudden you reach a, you, you, maybe you reach a new paragraph and you decide, this text needs some different formatting. It needs to be decorated a little bit differently because it stands out from the last paragraph. It's either a new section that needs to be bold, maybe it's a warning that needs some sort of a border, or, or you want to, to emphasize the text in some different way. So you, you go to your home ribbon, you go to the font section, and you start manually changing just that particular set of text to make it maybe a little bit bigger, have a different color, some sort of formatting change. And this can be horrendous to maintain. When you're updating your, the, your formatting this way, it becomes very quickly inconsistent. And it's really hard to have document continuity, especially when you're working with multiple authors who may have a different sense of how they want to emphasize different sections and different different warning warning uh, text and whatnot. So it's really best to adopt using styles and and following some sort of a of a style guide or 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 whatnot within your within your team. And so using styles, basically, if the style formatted text doesn't doesn't look the way you want, you can modify the style in one place and watch it update every instance where that style is used. Or you can add new styles with unique formatting attributes if you need to. I like to think of using styles as kind of like the single sourcing of formatting. I don't think that's really a thing, but this idea that you can update something in one place and then watch it, watch that change go all throughout your document, that's kind of a common theme with Flair. And that's one of the advantages of using styles. So in the screen grabs below here, I've got that, that temperature sensor document again, and I've kind of called out where I've used a few different styles here. So for this text here, instead of going to the home ribbon and manually choosing Arial, 20 point font, bold, and, and all those other manual styles, I've instead gone to my styles window, which I think is also accessible from the home ribbon, and I've chosen heading one instead. And if I wanted to change the properties of this text, I could just right click over heading one, go to modify style, and then choose different attributes. I could make this text larger, a different font type, etc. And then that change would, only, would, would, would update not just that top 
heading row, but every everywhere else that heading one is used in this document would, would be updated. Same thing with my heading two. As you can see, I've I use this in multiple places here. I also use it for videos and specifications. I could simply apply the style to each of those texts. And then if I decide collectively as a document, I really don't like the size of this anymore. I can modify that style in one place and then update it everywhere. The same goes to even paragraph text, paragraph notes. I actually use a style that, that puts this border around this text to really call special attention to this note. I manage that from a style as well. As I mentioned before, the styles in Word can be mapped to styles available in Flare, and I'll show you how to do that in just a little bit. Using styles can be easier said than done, though, and may require a cultural shift. Even if you're familiar with using styles or follow a style guide, it doesn't always mean that your subject matter experts are going to follow it, that other document reviewers are going to follow it. They may copy and paste text from the web and unknowingly introduce a new style or some different fonts that are used. So I always think it's really important that the last person to see a document before it goes into Flare be somebody that's really familiar with the voice that you wanna use in your documentation and the styles, and just kind of quickly clean up that document um, before it, it goes into Flare, because you'll see later on that these styles do map very nicely, and you can actually generate a Flare output that looks identical to your Word document with very careful attention here. Another piece of advice I can offer is to try to use as few styles as possible and try to keep them manageable and well-documented in a style guide just to keep everybody on the same page as to why we use a heading one here, why we use a heading two here. I plan to, to speak on the cleanup of some of these Word documents a little bit more at Mad World. So I'll offer some tips um, during that presentation, we simply don't have time today to go over how to clean up um, these Word documents, but I, I just want to really emphasize that the use of styles is going to give you your biggest lift in this project. So initiating the Word import has gone through a pretty big overhaul in a good way, uh, going back to a, a, a few Flare releases ago. You can now simply drag and drop your file into a folder of your choice to kick off this process. So what I've done here before, before I drag and drop my, my file in, what, oops, we've skipped ahead there. Um, I created a new folder in the Content Explorer. It's just an empty placeholder where I want my temperature uh, sensor user manual to, to break up into topics. You simply drag and drop that file into that folder or whatever placeholder you create and then click import to launch the import wizard. If you click copy here, that's going to, to, to merely copy the Word file as a Word file into your project. So if your intention is to import the file, click import and then that'll get the wizard started. So from this uh, page here, there's not really a lot to speak through, but there is some information that I think is important to, to, to go over. Again, I can see that folder that I created, that placeholder, that's where this document's going to, to reside. It lets you know the location. So you can see that this is a document that was on my, on my desktop and it's now going to be residing in Flare after the import process in that particular folder there. A couple other things that are worth noting, you can actually click add file and you can import multiple Word documents at the same time if you choose to. A couple of words of caution here, if you choose to do that though, you, um, you'll you find that um, every topic, it, all of these documents will still be nested into that same folder. So if I were wanting to import a temperature sensor document and also a pH sensor document right now, all of those HTM files would actually get generated into that temperature sensor folder. And, and then I'd have some post, some, some post formatting cleanup where I might need to move some topics around to, to, to fix that structure. 
Um, another uh, thing to think about is uh, if you do choose to import more than one document at the same time, think about the styles that you're that are being used in both documents, and you'll be better suited if those are consistently used and if you want topic breaks associated with the same styles um, otherwise it may be a little bit a little bit tricky to decide where you want your topic breaks to be and whatnot so i typically find importing one document at, at a time to be sufficient for me and i find the import process quick enough to do that uh, not having that cleanup after importing I save a lot of time just doing multiple imports. Um, you can click finish from here and you'll be one more button click away from finishing this process. But I really think that it's, it's a good idea to go through the styles and advanced options in every single import that you do. Um, even if you've done hundreds of imports, we've actually set out recently to document our import process and to talk about in in greater detail what each of these settings means just to try to make our import uh, process a little bit more streamlined and have everybody following the same steps along the way and one of the challenges that i found right away is that every import really has unique settings based on the styles that are in your word document based on where you want topic breaks to be from one project to the next uh, based on whether we're trying to introduce new styles into our CSS or whether there's tables being used. I really think that every import should be treated as its own import and just really take time to carefully review each of the settings and see if it makes sense to do something a little different from one import to another. And we'll look at that today. So going over to the styles tab here, the first option that you have on the screen is to associate your style sheet. So basically, in, in most cases, I think a lot of Flare users are just going to use their master style sheet that, that exists in their Flare project. That's what I've done in this scenario. You do have the option of, of leaving this blank if you want to create a new style sheet, which you'll have an option on the next page uh, to set that up if that's what you'd like to do. Um, but once you set your style sheet, you'll see styles from that style sheet uh, become selectable as you map your styles from Word over to Flare. In this particular instance, I chose to discard MS Word styles. I clicked that button, that button there, and it kind of brought all my Flare styles um, out that I could map very easily to my, my heading one from Word. I could map that to an H1 style from my style sheet here, and I've got style sheet settings that match this attribute down here below. So I can see a preview of what it's going to look like in Flare and what it's going to look like in Word. Obviously, the Flare preview in this scenario, uh, the these these two texts match fairly fairly identically. They don't have to. You may decide that once your content goes in Flare, this is your chance to to do something a little bit different, have some larger text, use a different font, that's fine. Sometimes, uh, and, and so all, all you really need to do is just go through and, and choose my, my heading two, I want that to match H2. Uh, my paragraph, I'm mapping to paragraphs, that paragraph note that had the border, I've chosen a similar style that I have in my, in my Flare CSS. I can also map uh, my bold font, uh, character styles, italicized text, uh, subscripts and superscripts, and you can even have the option to discard a style if you're if you're not really sure uh, why it's showing up there. Uh, you have that option as well. One question that I think comes up here from time to time, especially if you have a newer Flare project and maybe your style sheet isn't set up. With all these with all these mapping uh, options, yet you could say, well, what if the style I want to map to doesn't exist in my Flare CSS yet? Well, then you may want to append it to the word style that 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 shows up in the map to column prior to clicking the discard MS word styles. Uh, 
prior to me clicking that I did have some some styles so heading one had a uh, it was like heading one dot h1 heading two dot h2 and i can actually introduce those styles if i map it to those word styles instead i can introduce those styles into those topics and also to my style sheet so even if i haven't done all the legwork in my style sheet yet yeah, you're you're still not without an option here you can map it to these auto generated kind of kind of these merged naming conventions and still bring that content into flair for this particular product i have over 100 user manuals that use the same styles already in flair so it would be quite unusual for me to want to introduce a new style at this point none of my other product manuals are using so this is one of those settings that could change in your product over time though once your flare style sheet has all the styles you need you may find it more effective to just map to the existing flare styles in future imports so that's why it's so critical to think about each import setting as being unique to each import that you do and and again i can't emphasize enough the lift that all of your pre-work in word did to make this such an efficient process if i hadn't set up the styles in word none of these styles would exist in that ms word style um, column there and so i wouldn't have anything to map over and i would have to essentially manually create all uh, uh manually apply all of my styles in flare after the fact so this really is to me the screen that provides the biggest lift in your flare process and really takes advantage of all that pre-work that you put together If the style screen provides the biggest lift, it has been my experience that this screen could potentially cause some of the biggest headaches if you're not careful. That's not to scare anybody. That's not to 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 call a, a, a particular a particular unnecessary warning. I just think it's really careful to make sure you know exactly why you're choosing each of these settings for your import. And not all imports are, are, are equal. So what worked for one import may not work for the next import based on the status of your style sheet, how defined things already are in your existing Flare project. So always kind of keep that in mind, really keep each import uh, unique as you go about uh, updating more content in Flare. So the first area we'll look at is this style section. This is where you can create a new style sheet if you didn't map one over in the previous uh, page. You can actually have a new style sheet where uh, this might be particularly useful if, if your existing Flare style sheet doesn't really map match the styles that you want and you chose to go and you chose to map your word styles to to the to the word styles in that second column in the previous screen then you can have a new style sheet that has all those styles and maybe that's a cleaner way to maintain that documentation now pay very close attention to the next drop down you have three options here that can, that can potentially make changes to your style sheet and i know a lot of flare users are very guarded about their style sheet you have a lot of very specific styles that are set up uh, larger teams and smaller teams alike usually pick uh, one or two people to to really provide most of the maintenance to your style sheet so you just want to make sure you understand the the effects of of these settings on your style sheet now hopefully you were able to to clean up a lot of the inline formatting in your pre-work but that's not always the case and this this drop down will tell you will tell flair what to do with styles that are still using inline formatting so the the one that i chose for for this particular import uh, remove inline formatting it does just that it adjusts the inline spans to generic file tags and the inline formatting is simply removed another option is to keep inline formatting and again it does just that it keeps the inline formatting so that it comes into flare with all those manual adjustments and no particularly associated style your center text comes in as centered i think it may even wrap it into some span tags and whatnot but no formal style is being used from your style sheet and finally you have convert to css 
and this will keep the inline formatting and turn it into a new style for you into your style sheet. It finds the closest related style type and adds an underscore to the name. And this can be particularly useful if you don't want inline formatting in your project and you want a unique style attached to specific formatting that was used in Word. You may find that a particular author had, had a pattern of doing some very specific inline formatting to a heading one and instead of bringing it in and manually adjusting that in flare you could just here you can choose to make that a new style that 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 you can uh, use to adjust that adjust those settings um, as part of your style sheet just i add a little bit of caution here make sure you're intentionally using this setting if it's selected i'm not suggesting that people not use it but if you import new styles that are used in topics and your style sheet that you aren't expecting, it can really result into some tricky cleanup. This happened on our team fairly recently, so it's a little bit top of my mind for me right now. If you do find that you brought in a style unintentionally, you'll wanna go through and find, do a find and replace, find that style, search for the, for the underscore style that got brought in, change it in your htm files throughout your project and then run an unused style report and then it'll show up on that report and then you can more safely remove it from your style sheet if you'd like to it, it can really if you're not aware that certain portions of your text are using styles that you aren't intentionally using it could just lead to even bigger problems in your style sheet if you're not seeing the expected formatting behavior. Like I said before, we're pretty guarded about our style sheet. So I just always wanna make sure we know exactly what styles are added to it. So um, like I said, not to throw so much um, red flags about using that. I just wanna make sure that Flare users are aware that, that you could potentially add new styles to your style sheet here. In the topic section here, I typically go with the defaults here. Um, I did change the empty uh, topic threshold to 10 characters. I believe the default is actually 50. And I did that very intentionally because I have a particularly short topic that my topic break that I set at H2, it wasn't going to be respected by the import process because the topic was particularly small. And if I didn't adjust that setting, that topic, even though it has the H2 topic break that I that I had told it to set, um, it um, it it won't be respected. That does remind me. I think I forgot to mention something on the last slide, and I want to go back here and make sure I cover this. You do have a column here to set your 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 new topics as well, and in this particular setting. I chose to set my topic breaks for every heading one and every heading two. It's kind of ironic that I forgot to mention this because this is the one thing in the import project that I seem to always forget is setting where I want my topic breaks to be. When I get to the final preview window, I'm always surprised to see that my whole Word document is going to come into Flare as one topic because I forgot to set this setting. So. It's, it's uh, not surprising that I also forgot to mention it in my presentation here. So a good reminder to, to also set your topic breaks uh, from this screen as well. Tables are something that are much improved from earlier versions of Flare. You do have some, uh, some, some choices to make here as well. One uh, checkbox that I want to call special attention to is the set first row of each table as a header row. Anybody that was using Flare maybe four or five years ago, maybe it was a little longer ago than that. Uh, when you brought a table into Flare, not only was it unstyled, but when you applied a table style to it, you had to manually add a header row and then move your top row text into that header row and then delete the newly empty row if that sounds like a mouthful and you're you're not quite sure what i'm talking about anybody that was doing that process before is probably very familiar with what i'm with what i'm speaking about and and this checkbox now allows you to 
set the first row as a header row when you do the flyer import. A, a massive improvement, uh, in my opinion. You also have some options here to uh, a drop down menu to choose how tables come into Flare. And I think um, these, these uh, settings are fairly self explanatory, but in, in the particular uh, example that you see in front of you here, uh, basically I'm telling Flare that every table you come across in this document, use the specs table CSS that I've set up in my Flare project. So in your Flare project, you have your, your master style sheet and any other style sheets that you've created. You also can create table styles as well. And in this case, I have a specs table style that I want all of my imported uh, content to use that where, where a table is being used. Uh, I also did an import project with a colleague just last week where we had lots of different tables being used and we weren't quite sure what table styles we wanted to correspond to those in Flare. And so we actually chose the setting that said remove all table styles from the import. And that way we could kind of uh, kick the can down the road, so to speak, and, and make a decision later on in Flare as to what specific table settings we wanted to use. So you, you don't have to commit to using uh, table styles either. Your tables will still come in and then you can, you can uh, uh, apply that formatting later if you'd like. The equations checkbox is such a huge lift for me. I actually had an import project over the summer where all I imported in my single page Word document was an equation. It was a fairly complicated equation that one of our chemists had, had set up for, for one of our experiments. And instead of having to recreate that formula and flare, it was really nice to just import that as a standalone piece and it came in, it converted the equation to MathML and saved me a lot of time. So I am very grateful to have that option here. I'll skip down to the re-import uh, section down here as well. Basically, you'll wanna check these boxes if you plan to maintain Word as your source copy. Um, so you can import your, your files into Flare and then generate, you know, create different topics and still do all of your builds from Flare, but you can maintain Word as your source files. And what that means is that anytime you edit the Word document, you'll either you'll you'll eventually re-import that into your project and and the word document will always override the text that's in flare i personally find it more useful to have these boxes unchecked because i use so many snippets and variables and i like to sever that relationship with my word document once it gets brought into flare and instead uh apply conditions and other formatting and then update future edits I can I find it much easier to up, uh, update product names if I'm using variables and whatnot. So, uh, but some but some Flare users uh, do find it uh, more reassuring at first to be able to maintain their content in Word. It might be more familiar for you, or it might make more sense for your project settings. So once you click finish, you get one more chance to kind of review your documents, and you can see. Uh, quite a bit of information based on the settings that you chose on the previous two screens. This is where I normally catch myself if I haven't set my topic breaks. Right now I see about a dozen or so topics, but if I hadn't set those topic breaks, I'd probably only see one HTM file. So if that's the case, I can actually cancel out of here and go back to that styles menu and reselect where I want my topic breaks to be and re-advance back to the screen and then I'll see all of my topics populate there. I also see other artifacts coming into Flare. I see I've got a warranty image that's coming in. I see I have a table of contents that's going to come in and I have a master page coming in. What you'll find when you bring your content into Flare is that at that temperature sensor folder that I created very early on that's where all of my topics are going to live, but they're going to be alphabetically ordered. 
that can confuse Flare users, uh, newer Flare users that are wondering why all their topics are out of order. They had them in a very specific order in the Word document. Well, the TOC controls the order that those files are used in. So you can use that, use that TOC as your frame of reference for, for, for the order. And that TOC will, will bring in all of those, all of those topics in, in the right order. So you won't have to manually drag and drop these files. They'll automatically come in with the TOC as well. So it's really nice. You can also spot check your CSS if you were intentionally creating new styles. You can click on the CSS and scroll to the very bottom and see any new styles that are being associated with the, with the import. I find it useful to click uh, show source code and I can actually see all of my content um, with a code viewer so I can see the H2 tags and the, and the paragraph tags and whatnot. So very useful uh, having that, that show source, source code there. So once you click finish and your files drop in to all of those places and they get populated and they start to integrate into your Flare project, you might be wondering, well, what's next? Now I've got all this new content in Flare. What am I supposed to do with this now? And I, I usually recommend to go through and do a file check in your in each of your HTM files. You may find that there's some formatting that didn't do quite what you expected it to do. Maybe you have some table styles that you still need to form, apply some formatting to. It's also a good time to start thinking about the single sourcing tools that you want to use in Flare. Variables, snippets, conditions. Do you want to reuse a topic in multiple places? You have all these options now that your, doc, now that your content isn't tied to a Word document anymore. And it's all of these smaller components. The, the options are endless now for single sourcing and leveraging your content in as many places as possible. So, so that's another good thing to start thinking about once your files get into Flare is now how do I want to leverage all this new copy? Go and check out the TOC that came into. You may find that you need to, to nest some of the topics or maybe merge that TOC into a larger table of contents based on your project architecture and structure. If you're doing some print-based outputs, check your, check your page numbering, your page breaks, your chapter breaks, any conditioning that you want to apply. Uh, it's always a good idea to go look at that TOC and then make sure that ultimately it gets attached to a target as well because it takes a topic, a TOC, and ultimately a target to make a meaningful output file of, of all of your content. And then lastly, I, I usually recommend go back and delete any unused artifacts that came in through the, through the uh, import process. I typically uh, delete the import file that comes along to that, I believe goes over to the project organizer. It's, it can be useful to, to go back and look and see what all of your settings were that you used in the import. I typically, because we import so many files, it, it just becomes a, a, a bit cluttered if I were to keep all of the import files that came in. So I normally delete those. You used to have by default an extra CSS copy that came into the project that I would man, manually delete. That's actually something that uh, doesn't happen anymore. Uh, Madcap was able to, to streamline that choice. And I usually delete the master page that comes in. I already have master pages that I'm using for my other content. So I don't typically find the master page that comes along useful. So I'll delete that as well. But just try to delete any unused artifacts and keep your project as, as clean and lean as possible. In summary, I would just say that the more pre-import work you put into your Word document with styles, the more efficient your import will be. I would say treat each setting like it's trying to solve a specific problem to your project. The more you personalize each setting, I think the more you can leverage what each one can do for you. There's an element of trial and error involved here though. If you have a large import project, don't be afraid to import just a few pages at a time. Maybe use a multi-import process. 
refine the import settings, get a little bit more comfortable before tackling a larger quantity of documents at once. And lastly, never lose sight of the rest of your project, your CSS, snippets, existing content, output types. Think about how these new files will connect to all of these elements as your Flare project grows. And I think we'll have some time for question and answers, but I think Mike had a few more things to, to share with everyone. So I'll, I'll pass the mic back over. All right, thanks, Chad. Um, I believe we might have some extra slides. Yep, sure enough. So as a thank you for attending the webinar, their marketing is, or sales has actually put together a discount code for everybody. All you have to do is mention the fact that you attended this particular webinar and anybody that's doing any kind of a tool switch can automatically get a $300 discount. Again, just mention attending this webinar when you speak to your salesperson. And something else we'd like to announce, and Chad actually even alluded to it earlier, I know we had to cancel Mad World last year because of the, the state of the, the pandemic and all, but the way things are going, the way inoculate or uh, vaccines are being rolled out, we are planning for Mad World 2021 in October. Now we have heard the feedback, people loved coming to San Diego to our headquarters, but it was difficult for a lot of people to cross the entire country. MADCAP does have a satellite office in Austin, Texas. So this year we will be running Mad World in Texas, more central in the country. So it's much easier for a lot of you East Coast types to get to. So I believe Chad's gonna be there. I will be there. A lot of people will be there if you want to get this type of training from this webinar, but in even in more detail, um, if you're not familiar with Mad World, it's officially two days. There's usually an optional third day that you can add, but we always run multiple tracks. So there's a beginner track, an intermediate track, an advanced track. Some years we've even had a fourth track. But again, since this will be our first post-pandemic show, some of that is in flux right now. But with that, I do see a ton of questions coming in. Now, I do want to apologize in advance. We're not going to have time to address all questions, at least not live here in the webinar. However, all of the questions are being recorded. And one of the things we will put together post-webinar is we will have a document where we answer and, and document all of these questions. So in a few days from now, when this goes up on our website, there will be a link to the recording, there will be a link to the slide deck, and there will be a link to a document that has all these questions and they will all be answered in that document. So if you've asked a question, but we run out of time and we don't get to it, my apologies it will be answered in that final document. All right, and I noticed that even while I was talking, like 10 new questions popped in. Um, if you've seen any you wanna grab, Chad, go ahead and jump in. I'm gonna take a moment and scan all of these questions that just came in. Oh, actually, there's, there's one question that's come in from multiple people that I would like to address. One of the, 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 it's been asked a few different ways, but the theme is, do we really have to do all of these settings every time we do an import? A lot of that, it's, it depends. How consistent are the Word documents that you are receiving? If you're getting Word documents from 10 different authors and they're just not very consistent, then you'll probably get the best results by going through this entire import process each time. Conversely, and again, Chad, feel free to disagree with me, but I've worked in situations where I have one person using a locked down Microsoft Word template and they're sending me new Word documents you know, twice a week, 
but it's always the same person. They always write the same way. I've had really good luck creating an import file for just that one person. And I'm careful to name it. It's like, this isn't just a word import. This is a word import from Sally in engineering. So that way I know, hey, Sally's consistent. I will go through, make all these settings for how Sally writes one time. And now anytime Sally gives me a Word document in the future, I can just go back to the Sally from engineering import file and recycle those import rules. So again, it's situational. The more consistent the content you're getting in Microsoft Word format, the more likely you will be able to recycle and not have to go through that whole import wizard again. But yeah, that's definitely been my been my experience as well. Um, there there was definitely a time where we had actually only one import uh, one import uh, template that we would use that that brought all of our new content into just kind of a generic landing place in Flare where we manually moved the topics around to to their ultimate uh, resting place in the project but we definitely uh on our team uh found sometimes it was also useful on a team member by team member basis that that that, that i myself chad had my own import template another team member jamie had her import template and and a lot of those settings are carried over from from one document to another so you can you can certainly go about that workflow um definitely that if that makes sense for your project yeah you can definitely reuse uh an import template for multiple files for sure all right i'm gonna grab another one here this one came in has anybody successfully round tripped any word documents I want to kind of snip that one right up front. Is that possible? In very rare use cases, theoretically, yes. And, and if you're not familiar with, with the term, we have customers that would like to be able to start in Word, import into Flare, then six months later, export a Word document out of Flare, send it to somebody, have them do edits in Word and then import it back into Flare and have this kind of continual process. There is a huge problem with that thinking, however, and that is Microsoft Word does not understand all of the advanced metadata that Flare uses for single source publishing. Microsoft Word does not understand conditions, variables, concept markers. Um, gosh, I could probably go uh, drop down text, expanding to all of these advanced things that Flare can do. And you have to remember the moment you export to Microsoft Word, all of that advanced metadata is wiped clean. So if you try to re-import that again, it will come in, but it's going to overwrite your Flare versions and all that metadata will be lost. So I know from the 30,000 foot view, it sounds like round tripping should be a viable thing. Hey, it imports Word, it exports Word, but the devil's in the details. If you truly want a workflow like that, it can be set up, but you have to artificially reduce how much functionality you use in Flare, you basically have to dumb Flare down to Microsoft Word's capabilities. Boy, I took a lot of time with that one, my apologies. Um, if there's anything else you see in that list, Chad, we might have time for one more, and then the rest we'll just have to get to in the posting that we put up. Let's see, does, let's, Oh, I, I'm, so I'm, I'm hogging here, but I see if when I can hans, answer quickly. Question came in, can you automate the entire process? The answer is yes. Again, it's in the details. There are those check boxes to automatically re-import. And Flare has an automated build capability as well. 
So as long as you do the configuration correctly, I have seen one customer, now I'm not saying this is the best practice, but they use Flare to publish their HR policy manual. But the HR staff members don't want to use Flare. They want to use Microsoft Word. So with a very locked down Microsoft Word template, they have their copy of Flare configured so that every, I think it's every Friday night at midnight, Flare wakes up, automatically re-imports any edits that occurred that week in the Word document, and then automatically publishes the HTML5 version of what was in that Word document to the company intranet. So can it be automated literally from end to end so nobody even touches Flare anymore? The answer is yes, but there's a lot of details to get right to do that. And since I'm hogging, I'll give you one more chance, Chad, if there's one that jumped out at you. Uh, I was having a little bit of difficulty actually scrolling through the through the questions. I, I, I normally have a Thunderbolt display here and I'm just working off of my laptop. So I've got a little bit oh, gotcha. of smaller real estate to scroll through these. So I actually really appreciate your help here today. <laughs> All right. Well, I, we're already two minutes over time, though. So I guess it's probably time that we wrap up. I want to say a special thanks to Chad. This was a very popular topic. Um, we had a lot of attendees today. I know a lot of people signed up to get the recording. So I want to give a special thank you to Chad. I want to thank everybody for attending. Again, if we didn't get to your question, my apologies. It will be in the file we post in a day or two up to the website. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great rest of your day and an even better rest of your week. Cheers, everybody.